can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have the founder of Storylane, Storylane.io, Nalan. And Nalan, I'll, I will formally introduce you in a second. I like to always point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. Since this is part of the SaaS series, um, a fascinating one was the founder, Sujan Patel, of Mailshake. Um he talked about growing, uh, I think they have over 70,000 customers and some of the acquisitions they did along the way, which is super interesting. Also had uh, one of the, the founders of Zapier, uh, Wade Foster on, talked about their growth early on, um, and uh, Pipedrive. Um, I think when I had them on, you know, and they were at 10,000 customers. I think they have over 100,000 now. Um, and so that was a very interesting one. Also, what led me to Storylane was actually Andrea Santos, uh, who's founder of Full House, uh, F-U-L-H-A-U-S. And I was poking around, I was telling you this. Now, and I was poking around her site as we were doing the interview. I'm like, this is amazing. Like, how did you create this demo inside of your site? And she's like, uh, actually, that that's Storylane. I'm like, oh, cool. We have to have Storylane on to tell the story. So check all those out and many more. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25 at Rise25. Uh, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream relationships and partnerships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast or an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the strategy, the accountability, and the full execution. Um, so now we kind of are the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host so they can create amazing content and create amazing relationships and run their business. You know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and, and share what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com or email support at rise25.com to learn more. I'm excited to introduce Nalan uh, Senthamel. Uh, he's CEO and founder of Storylane. You can find him at storylane.io. Storylane is actually a Y Combinator startup that lets marketing and sales teams build interactive product demos in minutes, which then they can share with their prospects. Um, and, you know, really now in this era of remote sales, uh, buyers are making quicker and quicker decisions, especially with all the information we have at our fingertips. And so Storylane empowers those companies to drive growth through their product. And, almost allows them to touch and feel it like I did on with Andrea. Like I could actually touch and feel her product because we were being walked through this really elegant um, way through Storyline. Um, now this isn't the first rodeo. He's actually a serial entrepreneur. He co-founded Kinderlime and ended up selling that company. He's also a prior uh, founding CTO at uh, Dacry, uh, which is it was an AR, AR wearables company and even spent time uh, at Amazon. So, Nalan, thanks for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. So, just start off, there's a lot of fascinating things um, to talk about, but start off with Storylane and, and what you do. Absolutely. What's the company so, do? Yeah, Storylane, we are an interactive product demo platform, and uh, we started in 2021 from YC. Uh, we graduated from there. Um, we sell to marketing and sales teams, primarily Storylane as a product demo platform. We help prospective buyers uh, so that they're able to get and touch and feel the product itself. So today in the B2B world, um, you know, uh, buying and selling has a lot of friction today. And our goal and vision is to make it absolutely frictionless and people want to buy product. And that's why they come to your website, showcase your product. And right from the time somebody comes to your website, all the way they talk to a sales or start engaging with them. So hoping to make this as frictionless as possible. That's what Swirlin is about. Yeah. yeah. So this is what, if you're looking, uh, if you're listening to the audio, there is a video piece and we're looking at Storyline. And this is kind of what I was talking about. I was like, I love how it moves through with this like blinking and there's, it was red and this is green <laughs> and really draws my attention to different places. How'd you do that? And you're like, well, that's actually Storyline. So um, I love it. Why this? I mean, you have the technical chops to probably work on a lot of things. Okay. 
why did you decide to tackle this? Yeah, no, absolutely. So it goes a little back into what we did in the previous company, right? A lot of times the inspiration comes from what you built before or what you go through. So now you mentioned about Kindle Lime. So this was my previous company where we built. And then uh, this is an ed tech company. As a founder, you're always selling, showing the product to prospects and doing this. When you go through those motions during when you're selling, and then this is a SaaS platform, by the way, the previous company as well. So when we went through with me and my co-founder, uh, after we sold it, we had the moment like, hey, what were the challenges we really face in this company? And one thing that stood out for us was like when we were building Kindle M, there's a competitor of that. They 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 had a you weren't thinking um, where should we go on vacation after the <laughs> sale? You're like, what should we do next? <laughs> well, you know, it is uh, it, that's the culture of entrepreneurship in some ways. You know, uh, the vacation is thinking about what to do <laughs> business. Right. So, um, but yeah. Anyways, uh, going back to uh, the previous company, there was a competitor of that company. They had a demo on the website, completely homegrown, built it. We used to wonder, hey, we need to build something like this. Now, after we sold this, we were like, what's next? And we felt like B2B buying is changing, especially the COVID. Digital buying was on the rise. And we felt like, hey, we had this moment when we wanted to sell our product. We felt like, hey, this is what it is. Next 10 years, we need to go and build. And then uh, change. it's an opportunity to change how B2B buying is happening today, like kind of bringing in closer towards B2C buying. So we felt like we both got very excited about it and felt like, this is what we have to build. Absolutely. At what stage were you at when you joined Y Combinator? Had you, because I'm seeing, listen, we're looking at logos here, um, Twilio and Chargebee and McGraw-Hill Education and Freshworks. And there's a lot here. Where were you at when you joined the, the Y Combinator? And maybe just a brief piece about Y Combinator if someone's not familiar with, with what that is. Yeah, so see, Y Combinator is a is a is one of the best accelerator programs out there. So they do two batches a year, and uh, uh, we had a fantastic experience. Um, so we applied to Y Combinator um, on the last day, and we were not planning to apply to Y Combinator. I had a conversation with one of the mentors at that point, and then uh, he mentioned like, "Hey, you're planning to build this. Why don't you go through YC?" And I said, "Hey, I have some data point. We built a company. Do you think really it would help?" And he's insisted to go to YC. So when we applied to YC, we had nothing other than just a video, and we recorded and said, "Hey, build the company. This is what we're you had nothing, to build. no customers, nothing, no, no, not no product, nothing." So we went into the twenty one, and then once we got accepted, we said, "Like, okay, now in three months we have to launch something." And that's what YC allows you to go to the cohort. It's that accelerator. Launch something. It's an accelerator. So now we had some of the folks that we worked with in my previous company. They were ready to jump immediately when we called them and said, hey, you're just going to build this. Can you join us? So two of them from my previous company, they just joined us and started building. And that's basically where in the Y Commander we built the three months. When we came out of YC, um, uh, I'll talk in a bit about like YC experience. But when we came out of YC, that was when the product was there. The demo day, we launched it. We had zero customers still. Um, so we didn't have any customers. This was around no October 2021, I would say, uh, and uh, when we didn't have any customers. So slowly, step by step, we started acquiring customers. And uh, one of the things I love about what we do in Storylin is talking to customers, right? I've spoken to thousands at this point. And then uh, through, um, you know, either through call conversations, uh, calls, or learning about it, understanding what the pain points are as well. And uh, step by step, we have gotten to more than 1,000 customers using today. In the last two years, we had a great last year as well in terms of growth. So that three months is probably yeah. pretty intense. Were you, did you have to move to, I know Y Combinator is in San Francisco. Did you have to move there? Were you living there? What did that look like to, you know, did the team have to move? We were in 2021, it was COVID. So we didn't, it was remote. Um, so we didn't have to move. So I'm, I'm based out of uh, in the Bay Area. So we were here and the team was remote as well. So didn't have to move, but YC did it a great remote session. We had multiple sessions during the day talking to our um, advisors and mentors. Uh, that's how we did it, the session itself. How did you, what did you learn in that three months? Or was it just focused on building the, the product? Uh, building the product is something we will have to do about it. But I think the, the key thing that I, for me personally, I mean, everybody will have its separate learnings, right? So people coming as a first-time founder, it's immense. Second-time founder, we felt like, hey, maybe there is not much and we will learn something. Uh, the intensity of it, the cohort, the group, the network, 
is is huge and that is what i would advocate if anybody wants to go build a company if you get into yc the network the alumni of yc who was very helpful definitely what was some of the advice things- you got from some of the people either it was a mentor who was in yc before or one of the people who uh work at yc yeah, I think they, they talk about this very clearly, broadly as well, YC, which is like build something that people want, right? And it's not just talk, they live by that every conversation. And and we all know, everybody shakes their head, oh yeah, it makes sense, obvious, right, founders. But when you live by it every moment, every conversation, every product, everything that you're building, uh, it kind of ingrains in your brain about like talking to customers so often. So now when I mentioned about thousands of people I spoke to, it comes from that. You you don't think about tomorrow. You think about what to do today right away and figuring it out. That sense of urgency comes to it. And that's something that I've learned definitely a lot from YC. And um, so they don't just preach about it. They, they live by that every conversation. And um, having that kind of network audience around you, uh, you know, inspires you more in some ways, what you're building. Did any um, previous companies that went through YC mentor you or give you any advice? Um, and we we didn't. We didn't actually. So YC was, as I said, it was a new last day application. Uh, we know companies have gone through YCs, but um, uh, but not necessarily spoken to them. We went in uh, thinking, but YC is a, it's a pretty famous program, right? An accelerator program. So we had heard about them. It comes in TechCrunch. You know, the big companies, Gusto's, Ripplings, they're all like YCs. So uh, Airbnb, so so you know Instacart, all of them are YC. So you know the famous ones out there, the unicorns. So uh, so you know what they are about. Yeah. What were some of the feedback you got from customers that helped shape the product? Yeah, or potential um, customers, even. Sure. No, I think so. One thing that I learned is like when we started talking uh, to the customers while in YC, a lot of them were the design partners. Um, some of them, um, and then um, they actually we ended up talking to some of the wrong set of people initially as well. When we started building that, you start pivoting a little bit, you start shaping the product as well. So um, so good feedback we got mostly around is like, hey, um, you know, everybody knows that they want a better way to showcase the product on the websites. And uh, the feedback we got is like the time to take the operational effort to build these things, to making it seamless. So that helped shape us into more like, hey, these demos, and platforms needs to be very fast and quick for them to launch it on their websites, landing pages and everything. Earlier the first year, we built it in a way where we got the feedback. It was like slightly more time taking. All those feedback helped us to drive this more like in a faster way to adopt. So we have a PLG model. People can start up, start free, sign up, build the demos in 10 minutes today. And really they can build this in 10 minutes. Anybody can sign up and do it. So the, the whole idea of that came from all our conversations that we had with customers. That was the biggest thing I would say. For me. How did you, I know pricing is a difficult thing to figure out. How did you decide on that? And obviously having a free version, you could see mm, as, as this date and time, who knows, the pricing may change. So don't hold story lane to it, but we're looking at there is a free plan and it allows you one published demo. Um, and then there's a starter plan, growth plan, et cetera. How did you figure out were you going to have a free plan and why these were included and then the pricing itself uh yes if you if you if you what i mentioned in the beginning is like our vision is to make the b2b buying seamless right uh for that to happen it cannot happen only at the enterprise level or the higher level right we need to empower as many b2b software sellers SaaS companies to do this so that's one of the primary drivers we feel like in the long run right get letting people doing this free and putting these demos and showing the product was essential so if you have a product to showcase on your website, one demo free was for us became like, hey, it is a big driver to continue the upsell into PLG so that they can start using in different ways as well. So that's the reason why we went to the free version so that we can empower not just like enterprises, materials, but also the startups right out there who can go with that. And um, so especially when you're starting out, you want to show your product and you have a landing pages today. Hey, it's coming soon. But it's always nice to put a product and say what it could be, right? And this is basically one of the big things about it. So, so free free came with that, and started again starting starter plans allows people with a simple credit card to swipe it and use it and test it because it's a new category being created in this space. It's not something that we are taking a CRM and making a better CRM. People don't know about this. People people want something better and new, and they want to get an ROI through it. 
it always starts with a simpler, easier version. You're not going to swipe credit card for like, you know, uh, $2,000, $3,000 right away, right? You want to start testing and start simple. So that's why the startup plan for us, the pricing model. So that people can try, try out the product, solo creators, small teams, build it, put it on the website. And the moment they see that, they want to get a big deeper integration. They want more interactivity in the demos. They want a sandbox. We drive them into the growth. And so now you start scaling into your organization, multiple teams as well. What's cool about this, I find, you know, obviously there's a lot of benefits from a company, but from a, it's very sticky, right? Like if I do a starter plan, no, and you know, like I'm yeah. never going to take it off my site. I mean, most likely, like it's there. <laughs> so um, it's it's very interesting. What are some use cases for? It says obviously you could do unlimited demos. What are some of the ways they use your product? Like, yeah. and, and we can maybe look at a few. There's a customer showcase tab. So if you're looking at the video, um, but like a company doing more than one um, storyline demo, what are they using it for? Yeah, no, there are multiple use cases. So definitely you will see them marketing uh, then within sales, pre-sales and customer success. So broadly, right? Now within marketing, if you look, start drilling down, there is again, like uh, you have many different use cases. One is people using it top of the funnel, they call it, like people coming to your website, like how you are on my website, seeing what it is. People drive this as a lead capture, getting the intent signals and telling people who's on the website. So people get intense signals today, who is visiting your website, but it's even more engaging. Hey, somebody from uh, this company was spending like half 30 seconds, one minute on your demo. So those kind of data points become very important. Marketing loves the data because they're all about like qualified people coming in. So big driver on marketing top of the funnel and within marketing running campaigns, how do you upsell? How do you do account expansion? You want to show your product. Core of everything B2B SaaS is all about showing the product. So now as you start thinking about showing the product, marketing is all about showing the product best way to attract, upsell, and through campaigns and account expansions. ABM campaigns becomes very important within that. Now, when you say sales teams comes in, so sales teams have like, when you talk talking about like custom demos, POCs that you want to put together with your pros prospects as they're engaging more down in the funnel, you really want to have custom versions that you can show to your champions, enable them. So that's another place where we plug in actually, and people see a huge value within Storyline to create customized versions of demos itself. And customer success, customer success is again coming back to onboarding. If you go to a documentation pages, you get a lot of text data, but now you want a visual. So you want to actually know how something works. And that's another place where people use this as well. So multiple use cases that way and what we see and uh, to drive uh, leads all the way. Yeah, I could see that. Um... When people have different types of product, they want to put those on display. So they'll have different demos for the different types of product they may have within within their company. Um, you know, talk a little bit about the, you know, when we were looking at the pricing for a second, mm -hmm. how you decided on what to include in the different stages. I can see obviously in this stage, the starter, mm -hmm. there's video, right? So that I don't know if you found you got feedback and that was kind of more popular and maybe takes more energy and time from the team to build that. And and what why you included things in different stages here? Sure, definitely. Uh, I think uh, the reason in the starter, let me talk about starter. So we included, I mean, not just the video part of it from the capture. So there are two parts to it, right? Uh, you will see like one is unlimited demos, letting them once you're a paid service. Support comes with that to help you go live with the demos as well. So you can build more than one demo. Plus how you capture the demos instead of screens, we can mix it up with videos as well. And uh, it's just more capabilities and functionalities within them so that they're able to showcase uh, more dynamic content within that, right? Not just static ones. Now, the other things is analytics becomes important. People need data, people need information, who is viewing it, those signals becomes important. All of those come with a paid version, starter one. Now, when you look at the growth, the growth. So uh, being, just talk about that for one second. So with the lead capture, <clears throat> collect potential leads directly from the demo. Does that mean it will redact if someone goes on from their IP address or whatever, it will actually collect their email and data into your system? Correct. So we take the email information, like you can actually add a form, like our, ours don't have it. So some of the demos have it. So what it gives you is like allows user while they're interacting to fill in their email, contact information, everything, passes them directly to your CRM or marketing stack that you have of record. So it's a great way to capture leads. 
and um, you capture leads through book a demo or through ebooks. Like, how many people go to ebooks and put your lead, right? How many of them are really engaging? So you really get engaged, high quality leads because people are looking at your demo. So, so like in this example, now I'm like. You could, some people will go, hey, check out the demo, and they'd make someone put in their email first, and then it would take them to the demo itself. That is correct. Got it. That is correct. And Perfect. then uh, that lead comes to, your, comes to you for sales to qualify them. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And, yeah. and you, you also see the buyer reveal, which is also a paid version, even if somebody didn't put the email, but we still tell you which company they are from, just based on IP data. We are able to provide you information, which account, which company they're engaging. So that's another part. That's of That's pretty it. cool. Yeah. So, so, so they so could reach way, out to that company it. and say, hey, we saw you look at our demo, <laughs> All right? <laughs> We're start, we have a secret magic that allowed us to see who you are. Right. And, and I think people do that using people visiting websites, right? You know who is visiting websites. But now you get a lot of noise, people visiting websites, but you get really good quality when, when they're visiting demos. So you know, you want some kind of filtering, which high intent. So this qualifies more into a high intent for a lot of our customers today. Great. Then why did you include some of the elements in, in the growth? Yeah, absolutely. In the growth, you will see the capture itself is different. One is not just a screenshot, but you can actually capture your front end clone of your product, the HTML. So what I mean by that is like, so let's say you have your sandbox, your application, definitely a lot more sales use case comes with this, in the growth one. Um, I don't have a demo environment. I need to have a sandbox that I want to share with the prospects. Now you want to replicate what your sandbox looks like. So we allow you to clone that environment um, quickly by clicking through your product. So now you have a custom version of your demos of your sandbox environment that you can share with different prospects, different segments as well. So that's what comes with the growth tier. So now with growth tier, you get not just putting something on your website, but you also can get something like allows your sales team to share it as a sandbox experience. Now with that comes editing capabilities, a lot of customization capabilities as well. I want to change the logo of what I have in my environment to my customer logo. I want to change the names. You have those capabilities here, personalizing. How did you, when you did the demo day, how, how did that go for you? I know there's investors in the crowd, right? You're making, yeah. you're doing the demo. What was the result of, of your demo day? Uh, in YC demo day, it's a, it's a typically demo days are very short uh, in YC because a lot of large batch of companies go through it. Uh, a demo day went well, so we did use our uh, product, uh, like a demo on the screen quickly to show what the demo day was as well, of course. And then um, the demo day went well. So I think after the YC demo day is when we raised our seed capital, actually. So seed round as well uh, through angels and investors. So uh, we raised close to 1.5 in seed. So um, um, and then um, not a big round, but enough. We know what is important for us to take us to the next page. So um, it was uh, it was good. So um, and that's what happened after the demo day. Right? Talk about getting your first clients. Yeah, and um, getting the first customers. Um, you know, since we're in YC network batch, so we had another batch like three hundred people in the company. So first thing, what you do is like goes talk to other people in the companies who are in the batch, sell them. Right, this is great. So everyone's buying that, each other's. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think the one thing you should, they're all startups. They're all raising capital at that point, right? So I think uh, we spent enough time there and then we realized this is probably not the right set of people because startups are only going to be using it free. They cool tool, great. I'll use it for free, right? And we realized like, okay, great. Now we need to start selling it to customers who are in our growth tier because when we started out, we started with the growth tier and the plan that you saw with HTML cloning sandbox. So getting those first set of customers was, it's always any or any going out and selling, it comes with two few things, right? Email, outbound, reach out as many as you can, personalizing it, LinkedIn. So me and my co-founder did at least like uh, each day, like 30 each. So we did a lot of that. And then, um, so that's how we landed up the first set of customers. Uh, I mean, this was even due, not after, even before having the product, we were doing this because you need to know what you're building. So you're constantly doing. So by the time we had it, we had some people identified who was ready to get into a, a trial at the point. What was the first milestone customer for you? I think our first milestone customer for us was like, um, it was uh, it was a YC companies, some of them uh, who, uh, I don't know, so some startups who were our first five customers itself. Uh, but for us, the milestone that we were tracking is like typically in YC demo day, you start tracking with your, where you are in your MRR, ARR and everything. 
So for us, it was all about like getting the first 10 customers, then the 100 customers, and that's our milestone around it. And then um, today, we, we are able to empower like 1,000 plus customers using these demos in either in some form or other. That's how we measure it. Each year, we put some milestones around like number of customers along with that, like how our growth looks from ARR perspective. So 2021, we ended uh, ended the year close to uh, two, two to three months, around like 10 to 15 customers. That's basically where we were. What about, I'm going to I'm gonna share my screen here, and maybe you can talk about one of these. Um, I don't know, but we, we say it's, it's near and dear to your heart, but maybe like... Uh, one we can we can demo here that is uh, a fan favorite any uh and i had the people at fcm rush on the podcast but any of these that stick out like this was a milestone for you as a client customer i, I think uh, the first one gong was a milestone i would say they, they they came on board gong is a big brand around it as well and then uh so Gong, Gong. Um, I think um, they. If you go to the Gong's website, there'll be a lot of demos as well. I mean, uh, Gong.io directly. And then uh, what you will see is like um, they uh, they drive huge number of leads uh, again uh, through this. And you just saw the pop up, right? When people are on the websites viewing the demos, they drive engagement through this and capture leads as well. So, uh, so Gong was one of the uh, big drivers for us as well. And then, uh, uh, and then uh, if you go to product page, I think. Product overview, yeah. And then as you scroll through it, you'll see it actually there, yeah. Product tour on the top, take a product tour, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So so basically, uh, yeah, so they, they're getting it. So essentially you will have to fill in the information to try it out as well. There you go. So, um, so Gong was one of the milestone, um, definitely. And uh, because they were one of the very early, enterprise big brand customer that came to us gong and i would say the second one was nutanix nutanix is a, a public company and then uh, the challenge for nutanix was um, also they were one of the early ones um, when you go in they have a test drive in their uh, website uh, when you go to nutanix so they run clusters on their websites right so spinning up these clusters was so hard for them because it cost them money to spin up clusters if somebody wants to try it or just sandbox it so they had a way for people to uh, use story lane to spin up those instances but again they're also gated so they want your information and then you will get to do it so for them the biggest driver was like hey how do i run different use cases um, without having to uh, you know spin up these clusters every time but show showcase what this will look like through story lane so so those are a couple of milestones if we look at it from a customer perspective that you're seeing here definitely those are initial ones I could see, you know, really this is huge for a sales team because they want to show people the product and um, step them through it, right? And so this allows someone actually to step through uh, an actual demo because, I mean, someone could do a video, but it doesn't quite, you know, take them around specific steps like like yours does. And yours also can incorporate video as well, right? That is correct. We can incorporate videos as well inside the demos. Um, that's true. Um, talk about um, just learnings from the first SaaS company and what you bring to this one because of learnings or mistakes or whatever you made with with Kinderlam. Yeah, no, absolutely. So with Kinderlam, I think uh, uh, one of the things that I learned is we were a remote company even with Kinderlam. So it's not like COVID made us remote. So we learned about being remote even in Kinderlam. We've uh, been efficient in capital, how we built the company as well that time. And we're a remote team. Uh, definitely when we moved into Storyline, I think COVID made everybody being remote. For us, it was like, well, it's an extension, what we have done before. And naturally, we moved into a remote, right? And we've learned about how to optimize to work through the remote environments as well with the team as you scale through it. So uh, that's definitely something we, even today we are remote and we're excited about it. And it brings lots of benefits to it as well for us. Um, you know, so that's one thing. And in terms of lessons learned, I mean, things that are, we, we're definitely doing differently from what we've done before is um, I, I, even before Kindlime, I was in a company in Dacry, right? Yeah. So that was very tech. And I focused more on tech, less on product marketing. Now, I, after Dacry, I definitely learned tech is great, but product is more important at the right time. So we focus a lot on product. And with Kindlime, definitely I've learned this. 
product is great, tech is great. You need to focus on GTM and go to market and marketing around it. So definitely we're doing those things better today. And every startup you're learning some things, you know, you think you know them. And definitely we're doing a lot better. So one of the reasons for us to build a little brand around it to get to these thousand customers quickly. So we're definitely taking hyper focus on those things now. What did you learn from the acquisition process with Kinderlam? Um Kinderlam was um, I mean, in terms of learning, so we sold it to a PE firm. Uh, and then uh, it's uh, a P from uh, Warburg uh, in uh, in the Bay Area, so we sold it to them. Uh, so the reason why uh, we also sold it at that point was basically like um, uh, we are in ad tech space, and uh, I, we didn't feel like this is a space that has a market that can continue to grow at the speed in which it can grow. Ad tech is always like ten years behind in general tech, right? So they need it, and then uh, they adopt to it. So. That was one of the things. And we were efficient enough not to raise more capital around it. So, you know, be sure like, hey, we got to a scale and then sold it to another company. The acquisition was great. And then with the parent company, and then uh, in those two years, um, had a lock-in and then uh, where we wanted to stay and integrate this as a SaaS platform and offering within the parent company. So uh, I think for us, uh, financially, it was beneficial to take some time off, think about the next company, you know, and all of that definitely helped us. Um, but overall, uh, it sets you up thinking about like, hey, what else you want to build out, right, into the space. <laughs> That's something that you get clarity more. Yeah. For a founder that sold like you, what do you, what advice do you have for a founder now? Let's say they come to you, like Nalan, I just sold. What should I do differently, or what did you learn from that time between when you sold and and starting your next one? So. Most important thing we learned about it is having the optionality when you're building a company. I mean, founders, right? If you give it to founders, it's more about like uh, people talk about like the best, the best unicorns. Yes, you got to, you need to know the gut when you are ready for it to shoot for it. But then investors, it's a it's a probability game, right? They they they, they invest in hundreds. They want one to be successful. As a founder, you're spending your decade into it. Having options is very very important for you, right? One thing, what does it mean? It means like having, raising the right amount of capital, getting into profitability, being efficient around what you're doing, spend on what you need to spend, don't spend on anything else. It becomes very, very important. People learned it through the COVID times, but definitely that is something, it's even before COVID, we've been very ingrained in our minds. So, I mean, but that's something that I would recommend for everybody and to keep that always so that you have your options when you need to know what you need to do, like exit out of it at this point, yeah. What do you wish you would have known in that process when selling to a PE company? Um, I wish, I mean, the biggest thing is like, I wish I knew how efficiently we could have done even marketing. <laughs> and um, something we always felt like, hey, marketing means a lot of capital you need. <laughs> you need to, bring. but there is efficient marketing that can be done. And, uh, and that, always makes it like you don't have you can you can continue to grow efficiently right efficient marketing so that's something that i learned i mean like we do this today a lot more uh efficiently what would and be an least, example of that now that you do that you would deem more efficient marketing that you weren't doing at the previous company yeah no i think uh it, it's just everything that you're doing be it from paid ads google ads whatever you're running it uh being very hyper focused about it being like drilling down into like details about like what really people search for, where is the highest intent? Start, start, don't be very broad, be very detailed. Once it works, start doubling down, right? So until then, be be close to it, right? Uh, don't don't step away from those things. Uh, we that is one big lesson I learned, and we do that a lot efficiently. So I talk to with a lot of, I mean, we have sales teams, three, four people at this point in the team, and who's doing the go-to motions as well. Still very small, 40 people. Uh, but what we do is like, I still talk to customers. I do the demos. Again, going back into how do I take that and put it into marketing? It's very important to hear it. A lot of little inefficiencies. We we feel like, hey, we can just drive through capital. But you know there are some data points that you can pick and insert those kind of uh, knowledge back into your LinkedIn pro profiles or back into your email campaigns and running things so that you're running more thought leadership content rather than just more like a gimmicky content. 
So really focus in on the highest intent, not just to get a bunch of eyeballs or even free users, but the people you think that will get the most value from your product and obviously pay you. Um, what did the hiring look like? So you get infusion and of investment. Um, you have to decide where do I deploy this capital? What do you decide as far as the, the hiring process and, and what team members you brought on? So we're close to 40 and we've hired, uh, every, everybody's remote. So for me, hiring, I mean, learned from previous companies and uh, from 10 years back is like, I have a framework in which uh, I mentioned to people, like a very simple framework when you hire people and at different stages, right? I mean, like one of the things about a startup says, like you need to have a simple, it works for you. So it's work. So for me, it is more like there are two axes. You look at it. Hey, there is a skill today. They can do this job as a company grows. Can they expand their skill set? Number one. Next is, of course, the most important thing in a startup is like, can they get things done independently, right? Uh, so those are the two qualities. And both of this needs to constantly increase for, for anybody you hire. If, because they'll become like stale a year from now, because as a company, you're growing, but you need to make sure this person can grow. It's not about getting a sales guy writing engineering code tomorrow. It's about getting a sales guy. Can he expand himself to go sell from mid-market to enterprises? Can he has the skills a little bit? So that's what it is about. And for me, that is very, very important. And we hire always with that criteria in mind. This is always what I look for. And once they tick that box, um, they have an efficiency to learn a lot of new skills. Um, that's great. So it's worked definitely in the previous company. Definitely, that's the framework I look for itself today. What do you, how do you evaluate that, that someone can expand their skill set in that hiring process? Because it's really, I mean, it's tough. It's tough to hire. It's tough to know. It is. It's very hard. So the simple thing to find out is like understanding like, hey, this is what you're supposed to do in your, in your role currently. Like to understand, like, do they know, are they successful in the role? It's very simple things. You'll be surprised. A lot of people don't know. Are you successful in your role? What's your measure of success? What's the goal KPI? Did you go and ask your boss or your mentor, like, what does this look like for me from a year from now, right? Um, the second thing is like, a lot of people actually don't know. They feel like they've done a great job, but does it impact or move the needle in the company? What is it impacted, right? They don't know those details. So that to me tells me like they care about what they're doing. And in order to impact, they're ready to learn a few things to get that impact. So simple ways like that to understand and asking those questions and also finding out like hey, uh, what other additional things that they learned, right? Apart from what the role did, did you go and impact in other places, right? Those are the ways. But again, it's not easy. But talking, having those conversations, understanding what they have done in their career definitely gives that. What are some you know, valuable, you know, along your journey? You've probably had different mentors. They could be colleagues also. Who are some of the mentors in business for you and in some of the advice they, they've given you? Um, mentors is like, I, I, I take... Um, Firstly, I read a lot, uh, not, I wouldn't read, uh, there's a lot of content on the internet. So basically like for me, it is all about like always consume as much content as possible. Be it when, whenever you're not working or doing things, just consume as much content as possible. So the mentors and people I, I get inspired through is like people I've worked around with itself, employees, because it comes from them, because they have shared some important, great conversations about it as well. My co-founder Akash, so I've known him for like seven, eight years. Um, great uh, person around it. So I've learned a lot from the previous company uh, as well. And what we're building as well comes with a completely different demeanor compared to what I do. And, um, you know, I, I look back into my Daiquiri days and Amazon days. There have been uh, my bosses who have inspired me to go into a tech world as well in Amazons and Daiquiris. And uh, the Daiquiri CEO um, definitely is one of them that I've looked up in terms of looking ahead into vision, uh, Brian Mullins as well there. So these are some of the people that I have inspired directly and indirectly uh, to help me drive, right? At least to think about like uh, uh, tech and product building itself. You mentioned resources and, the, you know, uh, I don't know if you have any book recommendations, like some of your favorites that you've uh, read throughout the years. Uh, there are a few I've read, but I think uh, uh, what I consume more today is um, content on the internet, less books, more like because fast, short form in a way of content. Um, and then that could be 
podcast series mm-hmm. or uh, that could be like uh, content that you're just surfing through the internet, right? There's so much like news articles, products and everything. So pretty much that. And in terms of book, definitely, um, you know, a lot of books are on leadership books, effective mm-hmm. leaderships and other books have definitely gone through it. Podcast that I like, I listen a lot now is like All In. I mean, that's a, it's a good way for me to spend the time. All In, the okay. Podcast, yep. uh, I spend time on. Uh, I wish the content is definitely uh, less, a little smaller, but there's a lot of conversation goes in. But uh, I pick and choose within that as well. And um, those are the ones I, I love to listen. Mm-hmm. And then um, I'm more into geopolitics now. It's just like to distract myself from startup worlds. I am very fascinated with geopolitics, what's happening around the world from the time the wars have started. So uh, for the last one and a half years, I listened to a lot on geopolitics, how things work. Uh, yeah. It's just, Any I, other favorite like business or leadership related podcast besides All In or is that the main one? I, I love, I mostly spend time on All In. Yeah. On the podcast itself. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, Go ahead. No, I, I was just saying, I was because All In helps me think about like outside the startup world, right? Startups in general around like the economy itself. So that's probably what my fascination goes more into. Now, I just want to um, be the first one to thank you. Thanks for sharing your journey, your story, um, and some of the lessons learned. I want to encourage people to check out storylane.io to learn more and check out more episodes of the podcast. And We'll see everyone next time. Nolan, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.